Hi, uh, how you doing? I hope everybody's good out there. Um, what you're about to listen to is my Jimmy Page interview from 1977, uh, Led Zeppelin, I think it was Houses of the Holy. Uh, a little bit of background, um, I spent about a year <laughs> trying to track this down, making phone calls to New York, um, Swan Song, coordinating with Guitar Player Magazine, they were going to send me out uh, to do this story if I could get it. Uh, I finally was able to nail it down and I went out for 11 days in uh, 77, uh, spent time uh, on the band's plane, uh, in the hotel, uh, and what you're hearing here is the result of uh, those 11 days in 1977. Uh, Jimmy was um, different, uh, kind of a strange cat, uh, hard to read. Um, I walked into his hotel room and there was a monstrous hole in the uh, wall. He had thrown uh, the phone at the wall and totally destroyed the wall, plaster over the floor. Um, uh, pretty crazy. Um, he was drinking a little bit during the interview, but for the most part, it was pretty cool. Um, I wanted to do like the definitive interview that Jimmy Page had ever done to that point. So I had pages and pages of notes. I was a monster Zeppelin fan, uh, would play uh, Zeppelin cover songs and bands. So uh, yeah, so that's what you're going to hear. Sit back, check it out. Uh, quality isn't terrific. Uh, this interview is what, 77, 87, 97? What is that, 47 years ago, 43 years ago? Uh, on a cheap cassette player with a cheap cassette but uh, it is Jimmy Page from 1977, and you'll never hear that again. So uh, open your ears, and I hope you dig it. Thank you. And now that something was going on that was really being suppressed media-wise, which it really was at the time, I mean, you really had to stick down the radio and listen to overseas radio and things like that to even hear good rock records. You know, little Richard and things like that. As you know, and uh, not, not that that's got guitar. Because the, re the record that made me want to play guitar was uh, Baby Let's Play House, country. I thought, you know, I just heard sort of, two guitars and a bass and thought, yeah, that's it. I want to be glad to look at any doubt. They just sound insane, you know, so, like, there's so much vitality and energy coming out of it. But it was definitely on. When did you get your first guitar? I was about 14 or 15. That late? 15. 14, 15. There wasn't anybody who could, you know, sort of play. So, you know, it's all about like trying to pick, you know, pick up tips and learn and stuff. There weren't many tutor books either, really, apart from jazz. Which had no bearing on what I was going to do at that time. Right. What kind of guitar was it? Uh, Grazi Rosa, <laughs> which I don't think it is. It looked like a copy of a Stratocaster. And we got a Stratocaster. And uh, then black, one of those black beauties, which stayed with me for a long time. Because some thieving magpie took it to his nest. Over here. It's over here. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. But it's, uh, it's the guitar that I did all the 60s sessions on. And I got involved in it. Were you parents musical at all? No. It was a, no, it was a adventure of solitude. You know. <laughs> did they mind you getting in? No, not at all. No, I think they were, they were quite, uh, quite relieved to see something being done <laughs> instead of artwork. <laughs> Which I thought was a loser's game anyway. Mm, so you were playing guitar at 14, did you get in the No, we do not really playing it properly. I, was just, I had a few bits of solos and things like that. Not much. But it was all learning from records, you know, that was a thing. You had to sort of just keep getting records and, and learning that way. And it was just the obvious influences at the beginning. Scotland more change, but Cliff Gallagher also said she invented guitar. 
Johnny Weeks later. And those seem to be the most, you know, the most sustaining influences. Until one has sort of only James B.B. King, people like that. And, um, but I was into, uh, well, yeah, basically that was it from the start. The mixture between rock and blues. And then, um, I sort of stretched out a lot more when I started doing studio work than I had to. Because it wasn't like it is here as specialists. It's all, uh, you could be doing a film session one night. Or, or say, one morning. Do three sessions a day. And then, then there'd be something like a rock band. And then maybe a folk. One in the evening, you didn't know what was coming. You didn't know what was coming. Sometimes you but only say 10% of the time. And uh, we were just really up to, really, well, it was a good, uh, a good disciplinary. Um, it really took work. And it also gave me a chance of stretching out on all the different styles, you know. What was the first band you ever in? We got from the old bands and good friends, and then and we eventually found people that were, you know, that were playing as well. Well, I played in all different small bands, really. But nothing that we'd ever, you could ever get any records off. Yeah. What, what kind of guitar stuff would you like to use with Neil Christian? What kind of music is that? Chuck Berry. It was before the stands happened. And all that. I'm never interested in uh, Chuck Berry. We were doing Chuck Berry by Disney and Chief Vince and things. And, and um, they just, uh, at the time, the public taste was more engineered towards uh, top 10 records. So that was a bit of a struggle. And, um, but you'd always get like, uh, a section of the audience that were into what you were doing, you know. But then you just find other people who just went there just to sort of, obviously, you know, just get hucky or whatever. <laughs> you listen to the top ten, that was you right there. But, anyway, so I, I sort of uh, stopped playing. I went to art college for about two years. And I was concentrating more on blues playing than on my own. Um, I went from the art college. It was like a the marquee club in London, which had like Saul Davis. You see, now by this time, this it just started happening. And that stuff had come around again. So I used to go out and just jam on a Thursday night with the interview band. And uh, somebody came up to me and said, "Would you like to play on a record?" I said, "Yeah." Why not? <laughs> and uh, it, it did quite well. And um, that was it after that. I can't remember the title of it now. By Carter Lewis. I mean, it was Carter Lewis. And um, from that point, I suddenly started getting all this studio work coming in. And there's a, you know, like a crossroads with the art work you're going to be doing with it. All his music art. Anyway, I had to stop going to the art college because I, I was really getting into it. There's no other guitarist there. There's only one other guy. And he's a little bit older than I was. Well, about four years older. Jim Sarver? Yeah. And he was really brilliant. But it was just that, that was it. They just, they just had the two of us as they could. Because then we used to work together really well. And that was it. So you know, the sessions that you heard about and stuff. And until the point came where the Stax music. Well, not after that, really. Um, when it was more, in, you know, geared towards brass and orchestral stuff. And the guitar started to take a back, a back trend, you know. Right just the occasional riff. And um, I remember there was, a rock and roll, there was about six months of that, and I didn't realise just how 
rusty I was going to get until the rock and roll session turned up from the farm. And I could hardly play the, you know, I could hardly do it the way I wanted to do it. And I thought, this is time to get out. And I did, I just stopped saying that. And it just curiously happened that it was the same time that, that the Yard Reds had that split with Samuel Smith. Which I thought was a great night, but I didn't. It was, key. It was like the University of Cambridge, I think it was Oxford. Oxford. And they were walking around in a penguin suit. And uh, you can imagine a really twee, chilly bunk. And uh, Keith Love got really drunk and was saying, Fuck you, that into the mic, and he fell into the drums. I thought it was a great anarchistic mic. <laughs> And I was really, I got a message, I said, what a brilliant show. And there's this great argument going on. Some else was saying, well, I'm leaving the group. As long as you keep up, do the very same thing. So he left the group and Keith didn't. But they were stuck, you see, and they had, like, commitments. And then they stuck, that's the other thing. I said, I'm really worked out to do the dual lead guitar thing as soon as Chris Trier could get it together in the bass. Which happened, but not, not for long enough, I think. It's just a couple of months. But then again, it was a question of discipline. You know, you can do the jewelry guitars and stuff, instead of stereotype guitar patterns. You know, you've got to be playing the same things. <laughs> just had no discipline at all. No, he did have discipline occasionally, but he just. <coughs> well, you can make that. You know, he's, a, he's an inconsistent. But anyway, what happened was that. No, I think that not inconsistent, but you know, he's, when, he's, when he's on, he's probably the best. But it's uh, at that time and for a period afterwards, he was. Uh, he just had no respect whatsoever. I don't think for audiences or anything. I think he probably has more respect now. But at that time, he didn't. And that was all those stories of him sort of doing a certain moment, you know, walking over to the and all that sort of thing. <coughs> Don't think you can do that sort of thing, so. You've got commitment. Otherwise, you shouldn't be, you know, putting yourself in the forefront like right? that. So, you said, do something and then pull it off like that. Right? I mean, yeah. Weren't you playing like acoustic guitar? Yeah. That's early days. You were playing acoustic guitar, and I, I bet some of you said he didn't play acoustic because he didn't feel you were good enough acoustic guitar player. Yeah, well, I had to do it on the studio work. Um, and that to come to grips with it very quickly too, very quickly because I knew you'd be then you'd be expected to do it. Um, there's a lot of busking in there. <laughs> The early days, but I was out to come to Chris and it was a good school for the amount of time that I did it quite a few years. So you you were using a strap then for all those? No, no, Black Beats gives me this poor. Um, yeah, and this poor custom. You were one of the first people to have one? I read, I don't know if that's true. That's true. Yeah. How did you know about the guitar? Well, I didn't. I just, I just saw it on the wall and I had a go with it and it was there. And I just. Oh no, that's right, it gives uh, Chirakin a scratch thing. I'll try. That's what I had before now. And I'll try the game. And that was it, I didn't look back after that because it's such a wide variety of sounds and things. You know. It was alright. What kind of amps were you using my father's session? Uh, a Supra, a small Supra, which I still use now. <laughs> well, I did put it, but it got smashed out. <laughs> Somebody smashed it before, I don't know who. Right, let me try and get another one. It's like a harmony amp, I think. Mm -hmm. Mega harmony. And uh, all the first album was done on that. You've got to understand that Beck and I came from the same sort of roots. You know. You know that thing that you've written about, uh, 
the very akin is true, but not necessarily in the term of keeping an eye on each other. And if you come up to the same as you always got things that you like, you want to do them, yeah. To the horrifying point, well, we have done LLP, and uh, done you shit me, and well, he'd done you shit me, and I was terrified, so it was going to be the same. I didn't even know he'd done it. We didn't know we'd done it either. It was just like that, it's just because we came to the same route. Are you talking about the story I've now? Hmm? No, it's not a rumor. A rumor. No, I thought this was just an album that was really amazing. Really mm. incredible. It was real raw. Mm. It's like fellow sessions, the Kings and the Who and them and stuff. That was basically the guitar amp you were using for this. I mean, the amp was the same. The guitar was a Telecaster. For the who sessions and that? No, no. For the, uh, for the, um... Kinks. No, wait a minute. I thought you were talking about the first album. Oh, no. I'm sorry. No, no. No, oh, I said okay. it was all done on the Gibson. Yeah. And okay, I did, I did have a telecast. I had that And some, some, I can't remember what was done on it. There's not much there. It's not the only other thing. So you were using the Les Paul in the early days of the Yardbirds too, then? I mean, I'm, I'm about two numbers. The rest of it was all thinner. Because I didn't want to, because Beck was using an edge call. And we didn't want to use two less calls really to get the difference of sound. You used a telecaster? Yeah. I thought it was the right best thing to do. You can see that the Gibson, the, uh, the custom had a different, the central pickup, uh, central setting had a very sort of, uh, it like an out of phase pickup sound. Which Jeff couldn't get on the other one, so I'd use it like that. Was it a telecaster that he gave to you? Yeah. <coughs> Was there all kinds of work and stuff done on that thing? Well, only afterwards. Not customizing. Yeah. No, not really, only paint, but I was painted it and stuff. I don't know if you've done painted it, but you've done it. It was painting our guitars, eh? We're using the uh, like now reflective. Uh, I can't remember what it's called now. It's like um, plastic sheeting that gives rainbow colours uh -huh. on pressure and um, diffra diffraction grating. Yeah. So, and I had that underneath it, picked up so that you get these colours in them. Yeah. <laughs> I think I have those now. I'm low rider car and stuff. Yeah. That's fine. <laughs> Were you using box amps also? Yeah, you see the edges. They seem to be like me. They've held up consistently well, I see the edges. Even the new ones, pretty good. You know, the, I tried some. I got four in and tried them out, and they were all reasonably good. I think one wasn't so good as the other three, but they, they were pretty much the same as the old one I had. Because I was going to build up a big bank of four of them. Really? Was that one? <coughs> Instead of using uh, what I've got now. The trouble is you can't, I can't. It, some of those kids say loud, but I just can't. You know. Mm. You've got such a, you know, such a big kit. But they just don't come over the top of it. But, but in studio work, it's all that. You know, when you record it, you small amps. Were the AC30s modified in any way? The ones that used to be Arbor's, were they changed around? Only by Voxes. You could get these ones with special, like, treble boosts on the back. <coughs> which is what I mean. Which is how they did them now, though. You know, I didn't do that much customizing. Apart from, uh, you know, making sure the metal pitch point was in all the way through. Um, yeah. It gives us what they were doing <laughs> from, 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 you know, the earlier ones and, and so I mean, the, the telecasters changed rapidly because you, you could split the pickup, you know, it splits them, you can get a 
and the game used to get an out of place sound, and then suddenly they didn't do it anymore. So they obviously changed it for the electronics. Um, and I didn't see the video getting it back. I'll try to figure out the electronics on it. I knew why I didn't work, so, you know, go to this and just got the old one again. Mm -hmm. You use the Dan Electro? Do you have any also? No. No? Well, yeah, not with that, though. Yeah. But I did, I did maybe, you know, the last, the last sort of day, letter day, so. Little games album? Hmm. No, not on that. On stage, but, you know, as a result of that. I was doing that thing on stage. You used to play White Summer on that? Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What's the tuning on White Summer? Uh, Ray string down to a D. And then it's A, T, G, and A, D. So it's been right for. So I'm going to put this to tuning. Place. It is. Is that what right it's Yeah. <coughs> it, it's uh, so they're in C or C sharp, but it's usually. That's exactly how they do it. Yeah. Yeah. Was Black Knot inside an extension of that? Mm. <coughs> no, it wasn't totally original. Black Knot inside one? No, it was that one that had been done in the folk clubs a lot, you know? And Annie Briggs was the first one that I had to do that. And I was like, you know, I was playing it as well, and with Bert Yanch as well. She was exactly the same style. Annie Briggs was the first person to do that. Really. But Bert Yanch was the one who crystallized all the acoustic playing as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. In the first three albums of it. <coughs> Absolutely brilliant. Is the tuning on Black Hat Inside the same as White Side? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <coughs> and it stays in tune. <laughs> it's taking a bit of a battering that guitar on the phone. That down electro? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, how'd you come to use that to do the pieces? Mm -hmm. Is it, do those pieces just work well on that kind of guitar? Yeah, I just used to doing it on that before, so I'll do it again. Well, I'm not sure I might, I might change it or something else, actually. Because of course, like my whole life situation is different now to what it used to be. Now it's Marshall, then it was Vox. Vox tops of different cabinets and things. You know, it's all like a, a hodgepodge. But it works. Um, what do you um, so you have only actually played with Beck on stage for a couple months? No, more than that. Huh? About nine months. Really? I mean, it must have been incredible. Seen it. When it, it must have been, been in that moment. Yeah, it was. I mean, it's been going, oh, God. Well, that wouldn't bother you, would it, that noise? Okay. That's as bad as it gets. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's really annoying. There's no way of stopping the phone. You know, this puff and pulling out the wall. It's probably the next step. At least the one in the bedroom is terrible. You can't, you know, get. I don't sleep very much anyway. Just when you get into a super bloody phone, you see me. Caramel. Mm. Or you're plagued with the noise, and that reoccurs, you see, that reoccurs if you. You know. Mm. <laughs> Designed to plague your life. <laughs> Courtesy of Bella or right. So you guys would sit down and rehearse the parts, and then it would come time to play them, and. Well, it was easy to do, because like, over on the sideways down was a simple one to do in harmonies. It's just about harmonies and things. I don't think anyone else has really done it. Not like that. You know, the Stones are the only ones that sort of got into uh, two guitars going at the same time from the old Muddy Waters records. And, but this was more like, rather than really you know, into sort of solos and things. But you've got to have the parts worked out. And as I say, you need to find it. You do what you're supposed to be doing. It's something that's going to be kind of totally different. From Jeff, it's, you know, it's, which sometimes worked really great, and other times you didn't, you know. You can imagine. Yeah, yeah that's a, that was all right. I mean, there were areas of 
of improvisation, but it, there were parts where you had to stay. You know, like, say, for instance, if I was on the subway down, it would be something <laughs> Do you think you learned anything from him or him from you? I mean, during those days, or was it kind of thing? Where oh yeah, I'm sure. No. I, just, I wouldn't. I I say I wouldn't. It doesn't like you call place. I I remember playing a lot of stuff to him, which he hadn't, like the guitar concerto and Indian stuff. I mean, he must have been influenced by that because then he did the solo on shapes. Very much like him. It was one of his mm -hmm. classics. Yeah. Which I could admit, I wouldn't have been able to do at the time. Really. You know, not like that anyway. Yeah. It's totally, totally different. No idea, sort of thing. So, uh, I, you know, it's more like turning on another one, really, more than anything else. Did you see him later, like, when he played with Rod Stewart? <coughs> yeah. We were really good. We were just good friends until a point. Until later, you know. When the friends started. Sort of taking off. We didn't see much of each other anymore after that. Did you listen to Blow by Blow? Hmm. What did you think of that? I thought it was really good. Obviously. Yeah. Do you like Wired? No, I prefer the first one, but this series has some good stuff in it. Which one? Ones came out in yeah. Jan Hammer. No, what's that like? Uh, he plays incredible. Jan Hammer leaves up with his eyes out. I don't think they rock enough for him, but he plays mm. Yeah, he plays like he drives his car, too. So yeah. that's, that's really what, you know. He's He's a good did you use a box 12 string during the Yabus? Yeah. Yeah, you're reminding me actually, yeah. yeah. That's right. What was that on? <clears throat> well, I can't remember the titles now. The Mickey Mouse things. Um, some of the these signs and things. I know there was one with a biometric 12 string solo on the end of it, which was alright. I haven't got copies of them now, this is something that they're cool. I've got little games up here, I think I do. But it was a chaotic recording. I mean, you know, you did one. Can't you really order what it was? And I remember Ian Stewart from the stands on piano. And we just finished the tape. And without even hearing it, we came out said, Next! <laughs> And he said, I've never worked like this in my life. He said, I said well, don't worry about it. <laughs> <I'll get through> it. <laughs> it's incredible. It's done very, very quickly. Make it public, make it sound. Hmm. But still. We're using like a. It was things like that that really uh, led to the general sort of uh, state of mind and depression and wealth and economy. Because I really try not to keep it together, but it's just no chance. And they just wouldn't have it. Mm -hmm. I said, alright, there you go. <laughs> Were you using any pedals, any boosters, any fuzz? In fact, Ralph said that the magic of the band disappeared from the cracks in there. That's what he said, that was his last thing. And I said, well, okay, there you go. Because I was really keen on doing anything. Yeah, and probably because of the, you know, as a model, that studio work, you know, um, variety before that. So I was willing to have a crack at anything at all. So no matter what way they wanted to go, I was prepared to go. I don't know, but no, I just wanted to, uh, I don't know what really. Because there were definitely talented people, but they just. I couldn't really see the wood for the trees at that time. There you go. That's it. But I decided not to stop playing and going on.
He was hardly with the band for that long anyway. Who? Yeah. He was? Yeah. I mean, he didn't rec really record hardly anything. Oh, I did. It's the first that come back with the live album. <coughs> well, I ain't got you and all those things. Yeah. They're pretty good, aren't they? <laughs> um, I, I read that you thought the best period was when Jeff was with the band. I did. Uh, George Ogunowski was good for him. Because he got, he got them singing and stuff, you know. And turned to new things, and that's when they started all the sort of departures into this up now. Um, so, um, apparently, Simon Major Bell, they reckon for me, had, had sung the riff of Over on the Sideways Down to Jeff. But I don't know whether that's true or not. I mean, they just sort of spoke, you know, spoke to them about it. I know the idea of the record was to sort of emulate the sound of the old um, rock around the clock type record, you know, yeah. that bass and backbeat thing. But, you know, it wouldn't be evident at all. Just that, I mean, everyone, every now and again says, well, let's make a record around such and such. And it, no one would ever know at the end of it. I read that Jeff played bass on that song. No, it's not that. No, in fact, in the, that, that LP, they just got him in to do the solos. Because they obviously found it really, they'd had a lot of trouble with him. And, and uh, that's obviously the way they decided to do it. But then when I joined the band, he, he was more, he wasn't going to walk off anymore and stuff, you know. Until, well, he did, did it. But it's just, you know, if he'd had a, strange if he'd had like a, a bad day, he'd take it out on the audience, is it really? <laughs> I don't know whether he's the same now, is he? Yeah. He still is? Yeah. Christ. Yeah. I thought he wasn't, like, you know, because his playing sounds more, far more consistent on records. It is, I mean, it's not Because you see like the Valero thing. Uh, working with that, because the track was done, and then the producer gets pissed off. He didn't do it. He was never seen. He didn't come back. No fear, Bell. And he just left to sort of be injected. So Jeff was playing as a sort of in the box. And uh, even though he said he, he wrote it, I wrote it, that bollocks. <laughs> what, what part are you playing on it? Oh, the electric. Um, String. It's supposed to be a solo record for him. There was two sides, and it went to the other side. But in the end, it came out as a B side. Is that a, is it the, the one side down like a slide? Yeah. 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 That's his. That's his. That's his. Yeah. You know, like they start to start basically playing around the chords <coughs> and just sort of start, you know. Yeah, anyway, that's it. And then uh, the rest of it has been put. The idea was like the valves were there. Like that. It was just built around that. It's an incredible song. Mm. And it's got a lot of drama to it, you know. It's, it came off right. It was a good, good line up, too. The Keith Moon and everything. So <laughs> that, that band was going to be led up on. It was, yeah. It was. Well, not Les Zeppelin was the name. The name came, came later afterwards. It was, I didn't realise at the time that, that the name had been put together. In fact, I don't think it had actually. But that was said afterwards that that's what it was, could have been called. Because mm -hmm. Mooney wanted to get out of the hoop, and so did the other one, Entwistle. But it, when, when it came down to getting hold of the. Uh, it was either going to be Winwood or Marriott. And with Winwood, well, it was a set, it, 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 in the end, he came down to Marriott, and he was contacted, and the reply came back from his office, how would you like to have a group with no fingers, boys? <laughs> or words to that effect. Uh, so, 
part of the group is dropped. <laughs> because of course you see it's the uh, whatever it was, Judaism at the time. Small things, isn't it? We're getting it. No, it's just, it's, uh, but I think that other band would have been it would have been the first of all those sort of bands. Like a cream and everything. But it didn't happen. Apart from the Bolero, that's the closest it got. <laughs> John Paul plays on. He's on that, yeah. yeah. When you came in on Gubbers and beginning playing bass, what kind of bass? Benicky Hopkins. Right. Um, what sort of bass? Well, I just picked up the bass, Samuel Smith's bass, the um, Gibson thing. Gibson? Some, what is it? EV3. No. Violin instrument. Horrible. Oh, well. You didn't like it? No. On the first night I played it, I got terrible cramp in the thumb <laughs> and the right hand because it was such a, you know, heavy strings and everything yeah. to play after playing guitar. Well, my hands were really aching, but it was enjoyable. It you went down it? really well, you know. Do you I, know anything about the bass? Well, yeah, it was easy to. It's easy to play. play. It was easy to play that sort of thing. It was good. Mm -hmm. Because I mean, you pretty much play the same sort of thing on the guitar, so it wasn't any struggle. Really? Do you think Beck would have rather seen you stay on bass? I don't know. I don't know what he really wanted, actually. I think he just wanted to see his girlfriend in Los Angeles. <laughs> but that's why he went, that's why he quit that tour. He saw this massive, great tour in front of him, and he thought, fuck this is on <laughs> And he sort of developed tonsillitis mysteriously after trying to smash a guitar on Gig Bell's head. <laughs> and said, There's a shit hot doctor in LA, and the shit hot doctor happened to be his girlfriend. <laughs> and uh, so he went to see the shit hot doctor in LA, and we carried on through 30, 33 days of, <coughs> of double dates. That's two cities in one night. All living on a Greyhound bus. People sleeping in the luggage racks because there wasn't enough seating and no toilet facilities. The women on the bus, courtesy of Dick Clark. <laughs> <laughs> but it was, uh, yeah, I was on two bottles of scotch around that period. <laughs> yeah, it's alright. Yeah, it's a good night, you know, it was, it was alright. But, you know, after sort of work, you say for that. For a long period, whatever it was, six months, I think, and no money at the end of it, and all that sort of thing. And um, there was big management disputes, and uh, I would never be really let in on it anyway, as far as um, the royalties or anything. Mm. <coughs> and then the management changed to Peter Grant. The whole thing suddenly changed. There was some instant. Things were being dealt with just on a straight line basis for, you know. Uh, but the trouble was, the seeds of discontent had already and disappointment had been sowed already within the others. And they didn't see, you know, they thought, oh, it's the work this cause, you know. And that's really why it's split in there. When it really is just about the point of really being revitalised, you know, because we, we played Australia as a four piece and it was going down a storm, you know. And the Walker Brothers were on it that were really hot in those days as far as visuals because they all looked good and everything. And it was really supposed to be their tour and we were really sort of going down really well. And then all those sort of nasty things start happening like, you know, the PAs turned down on you and all that sort of when you know you're going down well. <laughs> that was great. And, and Ralph, he was really working at that stage, like, like he used to in the early days, you know, it's like... And I thought, well, this is it. This is the new renaissance of the band. We, and we were doing reasonably okay. Really. Not necessarily record-wise, but certainly audience-wise. Mm -hmm. Which is what it's all about, anyway. And, uh, but, you know, as I say, there's been too many, I suppose, personal things in there within me. And, uh, but no grudges between the members of the band. It was, it was just... Yeah, time to quit, I suppose. Yeah. So the only things that you ever recorded with Jeff were, uh, I think, a few time ago. Uh, I think, uh, stroll on, train get to roll. Well, it's like, huh? Psycho Daisy. 
Yeah. That was a good song. Yeah. And the Bolero. Right. And a few other things which... Well, none of them were the albums, but earlier on, since we used to do a thing. Early studio thing? Hmm. With Beck? Hmm. One we think so. Really? Yeah. Louis the Wire and things like that. Really oh, good right. though. Yeah. Yeah. Really great. Hmm. Were you using any pedals or any boosters or anything with the Arbors to get back any of those sounds? Plus time. Which I'd virtually regurgitated <laughs> from whatever it was, two thousand pound beam by the uh, benches I think it was. I made a fun time. There was nothing like the one that, uh, that this guy made for me. He was, uh, he worked for the um, Admiralty in England, in the electronics division. He was related to um, May, I'm not sure about May at all. Anyway, yeah, he did all the first pedals in the Hendrix later. And all those, um, you know, like, um, octave doublers and things like that, right. and things. <laughs> anyway, he made this one for me now, but that was all during the studio period, you see. And, uh, and that was, I just took that obviously on the road. I think Jeff had one too then too. But I, I, I was the one who got that going again. That thing, and that, that accounted for quite a lot really of, of this, of the sound being able to sort of boost in that sort of sustain and everything. So you were doing like all kinds of things with feedback and stuff like that. Mm. Mm. I mean, is there anybody that actually developed the control of the feedback, or was it just kind of something? You know, some people say it was Townsend, some people say it was you, some people say it was back. You know. Uh, well, it was, yeah. Is there, you know, you need me, the kids. I think I did did that bit there at the beginning. I've done feedback on different ways. It's just sort of going on. I don't know who really did it first. It just sort of happened. I don't think anybody sort of consciously, uh, again, you know, nicked it from anybody else. It was just, <coughs> it was just going on. Um, but Townsend obviously was the one that, because of his style and and and, and the piecing of the group made it more his style and so obviously it's related to him right. whereas the other players like Jeff and himself were playing more sort of notes and things right. and chords right. and when that reliance on it all the time so obviously it could, you know Townsend gets a you know the thing is. so you were using what kind of guitar then in the, the beginning days of the Justin? Pentecost. Same as the end of the yard, basically. The one that Jeff had given you? Yeah. Had the Telecaster on the first album? Mm. That's incredible. And yeah. And Jeff like a left ball. Yeah. Well, that's the, that's the amp and everything. You see, you know, I could get a lot of tones out of the guitar, which normally wouldn't sound right, you know. <laughs> it's like on those, uh, those early sessions again with those poor, it doesn't always sound like a Les Paul, but it is. It's just different, you know, amp play, mic placings and all different things in it. And uh, just cranking it up to this you know, distortion point mm -hmm. so you can sustain that. It's, it's bound to sound like a Les Paul, you know. Are you using that Supra amp? Mm. The first album? Still do. <laughs> <coughs> Um, are you using all of it stairway, all of stairway it's so always done with it. I pulled out the telecast stuff and not having used it for a long time. Plugged it into the super and away it went again. Right. And that's a different sound entirely than uh, any of the first one, you know. So it's a, it really was a good versatile setup. <coughs> are you using a Leslie or something like on the solo on Good Times, Bad Times? Sounds like almost like a yeah. bass for Leslie. Yeah, it's pushed for, yeah, it's wired up for an organ thing then, because he... But anyway, yeah, it is for Leslie speaking. That was an incredible solo. Mm. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> Could have been better. <laughs> <laughs> you credit to like um, backing vocals and stuff on the first album. Yeah. Did you do? Singing, yeah. Choruses and things, yeah. Did you do any singing on the later album? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> you can hear you can hear it really. Is that your backup voice on Good Times Bad Times? Hmm. Yeah. Good Times Bad Times. Yeah. It's really horrifying that sound, isn't it? <laughs> can you imagine that trying to sleep with that sound? There's no way of stopping it. Apart from pulling it out of the wall. So what do you do? The obvious thing and then you you know people say, Oh they hotel records. Yeah. <laughs> All right. What kind of acoustic guitar are you using on like Black Mountain Side and Dave and Gordon? That was um, a J200, which wasn't mine, I borrowed it. I didn't have one, but it was a beautiful guitar. Really great. It was a very nice one. It was beautiful. I've, I've never found a guitar with that quality really, since. And to be able to play just so easily on it, you know, really thick sound. And it had heavy gauge strings on it, but it just didn't, didn't feel like it, you know. You just use your fingers, you didn't use finger picks? No. Have you ever used finger picks for acoustic? Yeah, but I find them too spiky. They don't really get too sharp. You can't get you can't get the tonal response that you would get. Same well the way I see it, you know, if if you approach any classical with gut strings and the whole technique to that. <coughs> you know, the way the picking of the bridge. Well, there's two picking ways anyway in classical. Um, but anyway, you know, the whole thing is a tonal response of the string. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, you know, it's sort of just as important. There was a guy called Daisy Graham in England. But he never used any uh, uh, finger picks or anything. Mm -hmm. Thumb picks. <coughs> she used a thumb pick every now and then. But I preferred to do it with just a picking thing. Because it's easier then to get around from guitar to guitar. Right. Well, it is for me, anyway. anyway, but he's apparently, you know, you get calluses on the left hand, you got them all over the right as well, right, right fingers. You know, but he could get so much attack on his strings, you know, he really <laughs> could. Did you ever meet any of those people, like Burton Harris or those people? Like, no, player, no. Like the most terrifying thing of all, I only learned about a month or so ago, because Yanchi, Yanchi appeared to like, his playing sort of going down on something that was an interest. Tony got arthritis, oh which really did me in when I heard that, because um, he really was, I really thought that he was one of the, well he was, without any doubt, the one that crystallised so many things. As much as Hendrix had done it on the electric, I thought he'd done it on the acoustic. You know, and he was really, uh, he was really way, way ahead. Mm -hmm. And right. for something like that, that was such a tragedy, with a mind as brilliant as that. There you go. Um, on Black Mountain. He, have you ever heard Django Reinhardt? Um, like his last LP that they brought him out of retirement to do. No. Yeah. It's on Barclay Records in France. And uh, we've been retired for years. And they brought him. And uh, it's fantastic. Is it? And you know the story about him in the caravan and losing fingers. Mm -hmm. It's fantastic. I mean, you just, you know, you just won't believe it. I think he must have been playing all the time, but to be that good. But it's, uh, it's horrifyingly good. <laughs> it's horrifying. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's, it's always good to hear perennial players. Like yeah. Just, you know, like there's Paul and Dick on it. Is this Paul? Oh, yeah. You can tell Jeff did too, can't you? <laughs> <laughs> did you get that record just did Chester and Lester? No. Good. <laughs> Have you ever heard he's been a long, long time by him? No. Oh, Christ, we need that. He does everything on that. Everything in one go. <laughs> and it's just one guitar. You know, like, it's, it's basically one guitar, even though they track the rhythms and stuff. My goodness, his, <laughs> his introductory chords and everything are fantastic. He does the whole tone and he just goes into this solo, which is fantastic. Now, he, he did, uh, that's where I heard feedback first from Miss Paul. And uh, 
and vibratos and things. Even before um, BB King, you know. I mean, I've, 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 I've traced a hell of a lot of um, the rock and roll. Little riffs and things back to those called Chuck Berry, um, Chris Gallup, and all those bits. All there, all there in those songs. But then he was influenced by Reinhardt, mm -hmm. wasn't he? Yeah. Very much so. Definitely. But I haven't heard a lot of the, the record. I can't get my hands on the records of those songs, really. There's Paul Trio and all that stuff. Yeah, all Big Eye Gower and all that. Yeah, yeah. Guitar Boogie and things. I like to. Can't just, can't, just can't get them. Yeah. But I've got all the capital. Oh, please. Yeah, but, but you want to do Gemini and Oh, God. Yeah, Grammy. <laughs> mm. no, yeah. yeah, because I, I knew Jeff, you know, Jeff adored him. Yeah. I, I, oh, he's, I he's oh, yeah, he's definitely been, you know, just the father of it all, really, isn't he? Multi-tracking and everything else. Gosh, if he hadn't been there, wouldn't be anything, really. I was like, not inside, there's like more than one person that you know, that you play with. No. One guitar? Yeah. One oh, wait, wait, no, 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 sorry, there's, there's an overdub in the middle. Yeah. Just a few notes and things, but nothing really spectacular. Yeah, I'm just curious. It's just, uh, no, it's basically, it's all one. You know, across. Like a baroque yeah. thing. That was really incredible. Basically, what I want to do for just a little bit is just kind of go through each album and talk mm. about, and then go back to some demo stuff if you don't mind. All right. All right. Um, Communication breakdown sounds like it's coming out of like a like a little shoebox of guitar, you know, like it's just yeah. you know, it's really incredible. I mean, yeah. I'm just wondering, you know, how it's done it. Well it's the set, same setup again, but it was just uh, it was done in I put it in a small room. You did? Little tiny vocal booth type thing. And mic'd it from a distance. And you see there's uh, this is a an old, very old recording maxim which goes, distance makes death. Which a lot of the, um, which I really feel, I've used that hell of a lot mm -hmm. on, on recording techniques mm -hmm. with the band generally, not just me. And the, um, the whole, you always used to see them close micing amps, just putting a microphone in front. But I'd have a mic right at the back as well. And then, you know, balance the two and get rid of all the phasing problems. Because really, you shouldn't have to use any EQ in the studio because the instruments sound right. It should all be done with the microphones. But see, everyone's got so sort of carried away with EQ ports that they forget that. And the whole science of microphone placing is there aren't too many guys that know it. <coughs> and, um, you know, I'm sure Les Paul had a lot. You know, he must have obviously um, been well into that. Well into it. Uh, so were all the early, you know, records. Not that they needed. It was only like one mic, two mics in the studio. Right. Yeah, the first one I had, mm -hmm. I, a friend brought the Zeppelin album. Like, yeah, this is man Zeppelin. I listen to this on communication break. I just couldn't believe it. Yeah. And he said everything. You know. And he stamped the wall on the floor. Right. Like a motive. Yeah. Incredible. What kind of like your solo one, I can't quit you, baby. It's kind of like, you know, just kind of, you know. Can you remember it? Can you recall yeah. it? Yeah. You know, just kind of like. There's a few mistakes in it, but it's not. Okay, that's, that's nothing I want to ask you about. <laughs> I'll, I'll always leave the mistakes in. The I can't is, help it. The song is an A. Yeah. For the end of your thing, you know, it goes like, yeah, it is A to B flat. And it sounds like, like, you go, you, like, you go into, like, two up bars or something before, like, the rest of the band, the rest of the band comes in. Is that true? Like, towards the end of your solo? What timing was? The timing's right. It really? might sound wrong. And it's, no, no, it's not right. <laughs> I shouldn't use that way. The timing. I'm never wrong, it's just I'm not right. <laughs> no. It's the timing. The timing's all right. But, like, it's like, you it just sounds wrong. Yeah. But it is right if you count it. It is? Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, I thought it was really amazing. But there is a, just notes 
it's like the one that my kid and my. Are they? Yeah, I think. And that song? Yeah, I think it's if I remember rightly. But it doesn't, you know, the thing is, you've got to be reasonably honest about it. It's like the, the film track album, you know, it's, there's no editing really on that. Live album? Yeah. I'd prefer to call it a soundtrack, really. Okay. Because it was. It wasn't like the best concert playing was at all. But it was the only one with the same noise footage. So, so there it was, you know. The thing is, it's all right. It was, it was, it was just a performance. You know, it's as bad as it is. I mean, as it was. Um, but it wasn't one of those real sort of magic nights. But then again, it wasn't terrible night. You know. So, for all its mistakes and everything else, it's a very honest film. You know. Rather than just trading around for a tour with a recording mobile truck, waiting for the magic night, it was just there. You are, take it and leave it. You know. Now I've got a lot of, I've got a lot of. Um, live recorded stuff going back to 69 